Hi, today we have our friend Trish Fisher here from um, the Public Health Department. You all know Trish from our wellness clinic on Wednesdays. She's here to talk about stroke awareness today. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Trish in one second. Just a reminder that we are being filmed by Walpole Media. If you have a question, just raise your hand and Trish will either bring the microphone over to you or repeat the question so we can hear you. Okay, thanks Trish. Everybody can hear me okay. As Debbie said, I'm Trish Fisher. I'm the public health nurse for the town of Walpole. Um, primarily, I'm here on Wednesdays doing my wellness clinic, but I love to kind of step into the coffee and conversations as well. It's just so much great information to be able to get out to the community on a variety of different topics. Um, so for today's, as Debbie mentioned, it's stroke awareness, um, which is extremely important topic. Strokes are very common, unfortunately. Sometimes the signs and symptoms can be real minimal. Um, people often will overlook them. Some are more severe that cause, you know, more of lifelong um, detriments to your health and, you know, lifelong therapies. So I think just the awareness of know what to look for, um, different signs and symptoms, how it can appear, and the best course of treatments, um, you know, getting the help that you need, the faster the better. Time is of the essence whenever a stroke does occur. Um, I have just a quick video which just shows, you know, a sample of, you know, hey, this is can happen anytime, any day. Get to know your symptoms, just kind of overview some of the symptoms to watch for. Call 911. It's the first, you know, line of defense that is going to be the best outcome altogether. Um, and just briefly, you know, I know many people know what a stroke is or have heard of strokes or have been affected by strokes or family, friends that I have been. And primarily, it's involves the brain. Uh, blood vessels bring oxygen to our brain. Um, we need that to keep our brain healthy, to keep our brain functioning. And you can have two types. There's two types of significant strokes. One that is just like a blockage to one of those arteries. So oxygen's not getting to a portion of your brain. Once that oxygen stops su being supplied to your brain, you get parts of your brain that's damaged. Um, Sometimes it's reversible, depending on the length that it's been damaged, it's irreversible. Um, there's also um, types of strokes where it is almost like a blood vessel has burst or there's a slow leak. Either way, whether it's a blockage or a slow leak, it's the pressure that's caused on your brain that prevents the oxygen from getting to where it needs to be. And depending on which side of the brain is impacted depends on really your symptoms. Left side of the brain often affects the right side of your body. Left side will impact your language, um, a lot of your mobility on the right side. Right side, um, oftentimes it's more of the cognitive, it's your left side of the body, so it's opposite of what you might think. Um, and recovery treatments, the treatment's the same, recovery can vary significantly. Um, and then the third type of stroke, as I said, those were the two major, but then there's also what's called TIAs, um, the transient ischemic attacks. And what those are, they're called mini strokes. And it's almost a precursor to a full blown stroke. Uh, and those are the ones that have very um, slight, kind of like, oh, I feel kind of a little funny. I'm not sure what that was. Slight kind of symptoms that the awareness to recognize it and to get treatment for it is imperative. Um, so that's just a quick little background. I'll play the video um, and then I'll get into a little more in depth as far as what to watch for, um, best ways to treat, uh, different treatment options, therapy options, long-term, short-term, and then I'll answer any questions that anybody has. Let me know once I start the video if anybody can't hear it, if there's difficulty if you want me to dim the lights at all. Mom, what's wrong? My arm. Well, I'm gonna call 911. My, my mom, yeah, she's having a, a hard time moving her right arm. We, we think she's having a stroke. 
Thanks to a class Rosie had taken, she knew that sudden weakness and numbness in her arm are signs of a stroke. During evaluation, paramedics may ask if you are experiencing any other common stroke symptoms. Because Rosie is a female and over 55 years old, she is at a higher risk for stroke in general and as a result has taken steps to manage her modifiable risk factors which are diabetes and high blood pressure. Now that Rosie is in the emergency room, the stroke care team will go over her medications and medical history, identify the last time she was completely normal, review the assessment by EMS, and perform a head-to-toe assessment, including a focused neurologic exam. Additional tests will be ordered to confirm how best to proceed. Common tests include blood work and a CT scan, which is what Rosie's doctor has ordered. The two main types of stroke are ischemic and hemorrhagic. Ischemic strokes are the most common and are the result of a blood clot or plaque blocking blood flow to an area of the brain. Hemorrhagic strokes occur when blood leaks into the brain tissue or around the brain. Rosie, it looks like you're having an ischemic stroke, but because you recognized the symptoms, called 911 and got here so quickly, we're able to use a clot busting medicine called TPA to try to break that blood clot up and restore blood flow to your brain. Like any medicine we use, there are risks, and the biggest risk is bleeding. But given your history, the kind of stroke you're having, and how quickly you got here, I think you're a very good candidate for the medication. Are you okay with us going ahead and giving you that medicine to try to stop the stroke? Yes. There are also other methods available for the treatment of ischemic strokes, such as mechanical thrombectomy, which can be used to remove the clot. If Rosie had a hemorrhagic stroke, medication to lower her blood pressure or surgery may be treatment options. Following her initial treatment, Rosie will be closely monitored for at least the next 24 hours in the hospital. Her medical team will begin to evaluate the reasons why she had a stroke and make recommendations for needed follow-up care. Most stroke survivors will follow up with their primary care provider and a neurologist after a stroke. Many will need some therapy to aid in the recovery process. With help of common therapies, including physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech language therapy, improvements can still happen even two years after a stroke. It is important to keep in mind that even with quick action and excellent medical care, stroke can be a life-threatening medical event. Knowing the signs and symptoms of stroke, calling 911, and telling the operator that you suspect a stroke can all make a considerable impact on your outcome, because when it comes to stroke, every second counts. To easily remember how to spot a stroke, remember FAST. F is for face. Does one side of the face droop? A is for arms. Does one arm drift downward? S is for speech. Is their speech slurred or strange? And T is for time. If you observe any of these signs, it is time to call 911 immediately. Remember, stroke is an emergency. Be sure to educate yourself about stroke now and know that you can take steps to manage your stroke risk. Making lifestyle changes such as healthier eating habits, increasing your physical activity, and quitting use of tobacco can all make a big difference. If you have medical risk factors, taking all your medications as prescribed by your provider and going for regular checkups are key to reducing your risk for a stroke. Be sure to take steps to reduce your risk for stroke today. All right, and um, so as the video had pointed out, just the two major types of strokes and then TIAs, the mini strokes. Um, what I just wanna point out as far as the TIAs, those mini strokes as they call them, they're just as dangerous and just as important to get treatment for as a severe stroke. Um, it sometimes will come up with the same symptoms uh, and that's primarily you know, what some people will overlook if, you know, a little tingling in the side of the face, a little weakness, kind of, you know, picking up a spoon or a utensil or, um, you know, a pen, pencil, something to write with. Um, because according to the um, 
National Stroke Association is saying more than a third of people who have TIAs don't get treatments, um, and they end up having a major stroke within a year of that first TIA um, episode. So re recognizing treating them um, can lower the risk of major strokes. You're more aware, your doctor's aware, um, important things to, you know, they'll be a little more in tune as far as watching the blood pressure, watching your cholesterol levels, um, changing dietary, watching what medications you're on. Um, so I just, as it's, the name says, you know, a mini stroke, I just feel that it's just as important um, and just as severe because oftentimes, like I said, it will lead to a major stroke. Um, signs and symptoms. Over on the table, I have um, magnets of what they were talking about in the video as far as, you know, looking for the FAST. Um, so what you're primarily watching for is sudden numbness or weakness in your face, your arm, your leg, especially on one side of the body. As I said, if there's any sort of blockage, leakage, any pressure in the brain that's preventing oxygen from flowing, it's going to happen on one side or the other. The right side of the brain is going to be impacting your left side. Left side of the brain is going to be impacting the right side. Um, if you find some trouble um, with speech, sometimes you might feel that I, um, quite a long time ago, I used to work on a young stroke unit at um, New England Rehabilitation Hospital in Woburn, Mass. Um, primarily, our patients were under the age of 40, um, and what we found is with, as far as speech, it's they knew what they wanted to say, and they were saying, you know, I'm really thirsty, I need some water, and it was coming out, you know, I need help crossing the street, or, so it's, you know, not only just slurred speech, but confusing speech, speech that doesn't really fit the scenario of what they're trying to say, you know, I think, you know, I need help getting up, and they might say, is that a red bird out the window, you know, and it's that frustration of not being able to get that speech out. Um, so it's the difficulty understanding speech, the trouble speaking. Um, sometimes vision is impacted. Sometimes it's a matter of um, just one-sided. might seem like it's kind of like a little bit of a wall here, like a little bit of a black wall. You can't see over on this side, peripheral vision. Um, sometimes it's both eyes. Sometimes it's one. Um, significant changes, of course, you know, should always be reported to your doctor, your eye doctor, routine eye exams. Um, and then the last one primarily would be a severe headache, severe sudden headache. Um, out of the norm, uh, if you are prone to getting migraines, prone to getting headaches, these are pretty debilitating, painful headaches uh, that people have reported as a number one symptom. Any of those symptoms, of course, in yourself, you would call 911, but if you notice anybody, even if you're just, as the video showed, you're here, you're having lunch with somebody, you're sitting out, you're having coffee, and you just notice somebody's kind of all of a sudden not quite right. You know, they've, they're they not able, they know that they want to grasp their coffee, coffee cup. They're looking up, they're not able to get out what they need to say. It's, um, it's amazing just that knowledge of what to look for in every day, everyday life of what you're doing when you're interacting with family and friends, um, just knowing what to pick up on makes a world of difference. Like I said, time is a, the essence. Um, the recommendation, they say stroke treatments that work best um, is if the stroke is recognized and diagnosed and treatment is started within three hours of the first symptoms. That's why we recommend you call 911. That way, immediately they're starting with their medical um, evaluation by medical professionals, whether it's paramedics, EMTs that are getting them over to the hospital, if they can at least rule a stroke in or rule a stroke out of the scenario, once you get to that emergency room, there are that's what they're looking for. They're getting the head CT. They're able to see if it's a type of aneurysm, like a bulging um, of a blood vessel that has already erupted or started to leak. If there is a clot that's preventing the oxygen getting to your brain. That's why they can use what they call the clot buster medications. That treatment within three hours, um, is it's just such a small window because once you get beyond a certain point, the options of treatment 
change. Um, and not to say that prognosis isn't, isn't just as good, but they have found just with the most effective treatment, that time frame is what's important. Um, as I said, back to the fast looking at the magnets, there's um, brochures, there's like a little poster like this one. Um, it's very simple, just a little acronym so people remember it, the face. Anything that if you ask them to, so you, oh, geez, you don't look quite right, you know, smile. And you add just simply asking them to smile and you notice one side of the face just isn't as equal as, as the other. Very slight um, symptom that otherwise wouldn't even be noticed. Uh, the arms, if you have somebody to raise out both of their arms, it's significant that one will be drooping. Uh, again, it might be the same side as, you know, if they do have a, a little bit of a face droop. Speech, if, they're, if you ask them to repeat a simple phrase, is it slurred, does it sound a little strange? In time, if you see any of these signs, you call 911 right away. The other important thing with calling 911, you don't wanna take the chance of driving anybody to the hospital. Again, because once that a medical evaluation starts, the clock is ticking. You don't wanna take the, you know, oh, I'm, you know sh I, sh even if they say, oh, I think I'm okay, just drive me, don't take the chance. It, you know, that we have an amazing, especially here in Walpole, our first responders, you just rather utilize that service and start that evaluation right away. So the other kind of is how is it treated? Once you are in the hospital, you're, you know, you notice the signs of stroke, 911 has been notified, you're starting that, um, medical staff evaluation um, primarily they're going as the video said you know it's going to start with blood work it's going to start with a ct scan see if they can see what the cause is and once they can pinpoint significantly where the leak is the bleed you know anything like that that's how they can start the treatment they start the treatment um, with medications sometimes surgery would be needed um, other this other type of s treatments that are real specific to the severity and location of the stroke. Um, also important to remember that once you do have a stroke, you're at higher risk for another stroke. Um, so as I said, you know, treatment measures vary, but once you do and you're, you have a one stroke, you're basically, you're gonna be on that list for the routine assessments, reassessments, um, you're going to be a little more hyper in tune to any symptoms that do come up. Uh, they say one in four stroke survivors have another stroke within five years. And the risk of having a stroke within 90 days of a TIA is sometimes as high as 17%. And with the greatest risk during that first week after the TIA. Um, so that's, again, kind of reiterate. It's why it's important to treat the underlying causes of stroke like high blood pressure, managing high blood pressure. The numbers through the American Heart Association tend to keep dropping a little bit, but they consider any blood pressure over 130, over 80, or higher, they consider you borderline um, to high, having high blood pressure. Um, a lot of it, I guess the, <laughs> the numbers do, they, they transition quite a bit, but it's just with the more research they do. So it's knowing what your blood pressure is. Uh, if you're on blood pressure medication, having it monitored so that you know where you're at, you know what triggers it, um, you know different means as far as changing medication um, per doctor order or dietary or increased activity. Little things like that can have a big impact on your blood pressure, but it's important to know what your baseline is and ways to maintain that. Um, the other, I just lost my little thing. The other thing also is cholesterol. High cholesterol, believe it or not, um, is if when they check your cholesterol, they look at your total cholesterol. Your total cholesterol of 200 or higher is considered high cholesterol, but again, there's different components of that. You want your HDL to be a high number, your low your LDL, which is your bad cholesterol, at a lower number. It's all with your routine blood work. It's knowing what your numbers are, knowing that you're seeing your primary care annually, um, 
every six months if needed, you know, depending on their orders, but just knowing your baseline numbers, knowing if it's controlled by diet, if it's unable to be controlled by diet, uh, what medications work best for you, and medications that aren't going to be interacting with other medications you're on, um, and just, again, those foundations of good exercise, diet, and maintaining, you know, those healthy numbers. Um, other things, too, is um, that you may hear of is AFib, atrial fibrillation. That's when you have a real fast, irregular heartbeat. Um, many people will have it and not realize it. Some people feel it almost. It's almost like a fluttering. Again, it's, it's a diagnosis that your primary care physician will pick up on during routine physicals. They can hear it. Um, it's not, you know, a consistent thing. Some people are on medication for it. Some people, it's triggered by um, medications that they're already on, let's say. But what it is, it's that quick, rapid, little fluttering that they feel increases your risk for developing clots. And if you're developing a clot that travels to your brain, again, that's going to be then higher risk for developing a stroke because of decreased oxygen getting there. Um, high cholesterol, diabetes, um, again, that can just be a high risk factor. Um, so it, it goes along with cholesterol, blood pressure. You just want to make sure that you know your numbers. You're seeing your primary care. You've got a healthy diet. You're staying active. And you're just continuously being monitored. Um, stroke recovery, um, as I said, I worked at uh, New England Rehab Hospital um, on the Young Stroke Unit, and rehabilitation differs for everybody. Um, depend, it's a team collaborative effort for sure. You need speech therapy, you need physical therapy, you need occupational therapy. If um, some of your deficits are, you know, you might be able to use your hands and your fingers and using utensils, but you're unable to swallow, your swallowing's been impacted. Um, speech is impacted, you need the speech therapy, physical therapy, just being able to get up, do your regular activities of daily living that seem pretty nominal when you don't have deficits, but little things of knowing that your shoe, your shoe goes on your foot, getting your socks on, uh, fine motor skills. It's um, a process that started in the acute care hospital once you're transferred into rehab to be able to get that inpatient rehab services. And then once you're transferred home, uh, being able to have home health aid services, again, just to help with the progression of improvement. A lot of it is retraining the brain almost. Uh, your brain has gone through some sort of uh, traumatic event. Um, and it just needs to be retrained to remember, oh yeah, this is how you form your words. This is how you know, you use this pincer grasp to be able to pick up that pencil again. Uh, and as I said, recovery time for after stroke is different for everyone. It can be weeks, months, it can be years. It could have a lifelong impact on your life. Um, but it's just a matter of recognizing that, having support systems, um, reaching out within your community for services that are available, whether it's through uh, the community here that you live in, adaptive, uh, ad adaptive devices um, that are available to you, um, home health services, even support groups. There's so many stroke support groups. There's stroke support groups for family members that are dealing with it within their home. Um, it's just there's so many resources I feel are really untapped that we need to take advantage of. Um, this, is, this is why they're there, and it's a matter of you just need to come out and ask whether it's here, whether it's through me, um, even through, you know, the Walpole VNA. There's just so much that Walpole can offer um, that you just need to ask. And if I don't know somebody specifically for that need or for your family member, I'm able to then reach out through my resources and see what we can, you know, kind of put together and collaborate for you. Um, and again, things to think about for family members, friends that have suffered from stroke, um, it's just also having that patience and understanding and awareness of what they'll be going through as far as to, um, the paralysis, working towards getting mobility back, um, the trouble with thinking, awareness, attention, learning, uh, judgment, 
some of those cognitive functions tend to be a little bit later to come back. Physical tends to come back a little bit quicker. Cognitive function might take a little bit longer. Um, and a lot of the long-term impacts um, would even just be memory problems. You know, you're kind of forgetting your, your train of thought, your, um, you know, sometimes they have trouble controlling like their emotions or their facial expressions. Um, difficulty with chewing, swallowing, oftentimes stroke uh, survivors are on a set diet. You know, there's just certain things that they're, they're really would still struggle with if they still have any sort of um, swallowing problems that they just will take significant long ter longer time to regain or they might not ever regain it and it's just a complete diet change. Um, depression is important to think of, a lot of frustration, um, depression with the recovery process, uh, it depending like I said on the side, you know, if it's the left side of your brain that was impacted, the language, so they might, you know, everything else is work, they just can't, the language is what's gonna be, you know, longer to come back and a train and retrain, and it's, it's extremely frustrating, you get frustration, you get anger, you get resentment, um, leading into depression, and it just kind of then develops into more of that mental health concern. That's why I just wanna reiterate, you know, support systems that are out there are imperative. Um, for all, all types of the recovery, whether it's for yourself, recovering from a stroke, anybody that you're directly impacted with that. Um, I discussed, you know, some of the therapies and a lot of the um, risk factors to look for, high blood pressure, AFib, high cholesterol, diabetes, um, and just the awareness of what to look for and what to do if, if you come across that either for yourself or somebody that you are with. Um, I am more than happy to take any questions, um, any questions on any of the information I have, feedback, yes sir. So I was very interested in what you had to say about how it's uh, really important to act quickly. Uh, but I can think of situations that I've encountered either in myself or in another person in the past where they've already had um, a brain malfunction such as dyslexia um, or uh, some symptoms of dementia which have already been identified by a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, and in cases like that, I, I think it's much more difficult to know whether what you're observing is something new or something which uh, has been existing for a while and maybe is just a little worse but is really the underlying condition that's been there for a while. Is there any advice on how to distinguish between whether it's a, a TIA or, or a, a different form of stroke or whether it's simply the ongoing symptoms that have just got a little worse? That's a, um, that's a great question because it is hard to, to decipher at that point. Um, my best advice would be knowing the baseline. What is the baseline of their deficits that they have already? And I feel that um, if there's a sudden progression of anything that seems to be getting worse or pretty significant change from that baseline, I think it's worth still acting more emergently on it. Um, I feel with um, any sort of brain injuries, the primary difference between a uh, brain, in, you know, depending on the type of brain injury in the stroke might be that sudden weakness or paralysis, that sudden drooping. Um, I feel that with the stroke symptoms, it often is a, a sudden onset. So it's a matter of when you are you know, with your person that has any sort of deficits, if it's it's pretty significant change that seems pretty quick, that onset, I would look at that as an emergent concern for stroke symptoms. Absolutely. It's difficult, too, if the baseline is not very clear-cut. It's not very black and white. Um, it's difficult to kind of know any sort of alternate from that. 
but that would be the best advice I would have would be the on the urgency like the suddenness of the onset um, and how significant that change is I think it's also really difficult if it's in yourself absolutely absolutely to know okay is this just a progression of what I already have going on or is this something more I need to be concerned about and again I feel that it's um, even like with the, I can't even say the severity of it because even with the TIA, a mini stroke, they're very subtle changes, very subtle, like a little tingling, a little bit of numbness, a little, uh, you know, it doesn't quite feel right. But again, it's the suddenness of the onset of it um, that if I feel that in any case, it's just better to be safe than sorry to get that evaluation. Um, to not take that chance to say, oh, maybe I'll just wait and see how I feel in the morning. Um, anything, any sort of, you know, as I said, the cognitive, the speech, the weakness, the little bit of drooping, um, anything like that, even if it's just minimal and it could be a progression of a condition already existing, a, an existing condition, um, it just, you don't know. It's impossible to know the, the difference. So be, it's worth getting evaluated, absolutely. Or at least reaching out to somebody if you're alone and living alone. You come on over, you know, I'm just not quite feeling right. Even if it's something you might not recognize, somebody then coming in that knows you, it's, oh my gosh, yes, nope, you absolutely need to be seen. Oh, every hospital have TPA. Most, uh, it's hard to say with the community hospitals. Um, if you're being transported, um, emergency personnel will most likely take you to one of the Boston hospitals um, because of the availability of it, the readily available. Um, I know that was the case quite a few years ago, but I'm not sure as far as the community hospitals if they have more of um, set guidelines now where it is available. Right. You go to work, especially if you don't have a local hospital. Right? Not having Norwood available. Right. Yep. For the trauma, trauma centers, and I, I feel that that's the real stressor of calling nine one one and getting that initial assessment by medical personnel because if there's any question. That's going to be primarily. That's going to be big deciding factor as far as what hospital they're bringing you to. Um, as I said, I don't know if a lot of the community hospitals now, where there's more, it's readily available. It's not quite such a new age kind of treatment anymore, where it was really just select hospitals that offered it. Um, I don't know if it's more of a standard now for a lot of the community hospitals to have it on hand. is a headache I mean is that one of the first symptoms of a stroke not necessarily it's more um, the headache that they say to watch for it is um, different than if you're suffering from migraines and it's not like just uh, it's more of that sharp piercing debilitating pain um, it's not to say that again it's everything is it's not to say that you know, a persistent headache with no other causes, you know, you're drinking enough, you're sleeping enough, you're eating well. Um, again, any sort of persistent headache like that, we always recommend getting evaluated by your primary just to see if there's a course uh, cause. Sometimes headaches are just headaches, um, but you never, you know, you just don't want to take any chances within your brain if you have persistent painful headaches, particularly in one area, if it feels like it's always on one side and nothing seems to be helping as far as you know your doctor said to try increasing your fluids and taking Tylenol at night um, it's just good to always have that open dialogue with your primary um, because for as far as for headaches you know they'll keep um, track of it there's you know different scales that they'll rate it on um, they'll see if it's like okay this is significantly increasing this is about the same this headache started when you started this medication or started, you know, you always seem to be in the springtime when the allergies are worse. You know, they have 
these scales that will be able to track and give them an idea of like, oh no, this is out of the norm. Severity is different. Location, um, you feel like you it impacts your vision a little bit. Um, anything like that, again, it's as long as you have that open dialogue with your primary, they'll have a record of any history of headaches and medications, headaches um, that develop into migraines, triggers for migraines, so that they'll be able to see anything out of the norm. It'll be up on their radar a little bit easier. But again, it's one of those symptoms that you just don't want to ignore if it progressively gets worse um, and your regular kind of treatments for it like resting, improving your diet, hydration, don't seem to be changing it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions, concerns, thoughts? Anything else I can answer? I have one more question. Yeah, of course. If a person's having a TIA yep. and they're alone, yep. and the sim symptoms are subtle, yep. Where do you go from there? I mean, if I mean, it's easy to play that down. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, which is why presentations like this are so important. Um, you don't want to play it down. Anything like that, any sort of weakness, um, you know, drooping, anything if it's, and especially if you're alone, if you have the ability to get to the phone, you call 911. You don't even think twice about it. Um, you know, if you have a med alert button at all um, here on your wrist, um, again, you press it. You have somebody come evaluate you. And if and if it is ends up that, oh, it's something benign or something, it was just a passing, you know, oh, it got up too quick or I didn't eat breakfast this morning or something like that, then that that's what it's ruled. Um, but you don't, you don't want to ignore those type of symptoms. You don't want to just kind of brush it off and see it's, again, the importance of, getting evaluated and not driving yourself there, not driving yourself to an urgent care, but calling 911, have them come in, have them come in and check you out, check your vitals, you know, concern enough, they'll bring you in to be evaluated at the hospital. Absolutely. But that's it. Some of them, that's with, you know, stroke awareness in general. It's a lot of times it is so minimal that it's overlooked. Um, and you don't want to overlook any of those symptoms. Yes? Isn't an EMT or someone who does that work for us know which hospitals we should be brought to once we pick up the phone 911? I think I'm having a stroke. Absolutely. Well, yes. That would be something, it would be a quick question right away. Yes. Yep. So the question was, you know, that the EMTs, the ones who do call 911, if you're questioning that you could have, yep. Yes, and I, that's why I want to say that, um, kind of that's why they are really putting that emphasis to not wait, to not drive yourself. So if you're not feeling quite right and you drive yourself to Good Samaritan, and it does end up being a stroke that they don't have the treatment available, if you're calling 911, that's your concern. You're calling yourself or family members calling for you. It's imperative to mention the concern of having a stroke because they will know if there's, they know, well, okay, I know Good Samaritan may or may not have that availability. They'll get you into Boston. Um, so they'll know exactly depending on, I feel that with um, many different calls and injuries, you know, head traumas or bad falls, they'll know which hospitals they'll be bringing you into. Um, again, just the importance of why you need to reach out to them. You call 911. If there's even a question, they're already getting that kind of process in the works as they're on their way to go check you out, do the evaluation, um, and they'll already have the kind of a, ahead a couple steps to know which direction they'll be bringing you. Yes. It's not something that's going to happen within EMT moments, right? Right. Oh, sure. Because there's so many additional um, tests that do need to be done, which is why they say quicker you start getting evaluated, the better. Because if you're kind of feminine and har and, yep, you have the EMTs coming, they're then transporting you. You're then getting into the hospital. 
um, getting evaluated by their medical team. You need that CT done so they know exactly what, where, and how they're treating the blood work. It's just the time, more time, more time in order to get the um, appropriate treatment. And that's exactly it. I feel like they do. The Boston ones, absolutely. That's their number one. No. Oh my gosh. You don't need to hear. It's busy. No, exactly. Yeah. Um, depending on if the severity of um, the stroke, you know, if, if it's more life threatening and they just need you get in and get treated, they're going to bring you to the most appropriate hospital. Um, otherwise, I know that that's a big question. Oftentimes it is requested, um, especially now with Norwood closed. Um, but it's always worth, oftentimes, if they're not able to get you to, let's say, your hospital, Brigham and Women's, they got to bring you into a partner's. The, the paramedics and EMTs are phenomenal. They'll be able to notify that staff. They're able to then, you know, it takes a little while, but get those records that you need. Um, but it's always important to say where your primary is located out of, what system, because um, again, it's, um, you know, having that information in the house too, you know, with so that when the emergency happens, if they're able to get your medications, your allergies, see your primary, um, you know, that's important information. Well, I was just gonna say, talking about the importance of calling 911. What happens is, it, when if you go in with with the uh, paramedics, they they take you right away. If if you have a friend, a relative drive you, you know you're going to wait longer in the emergency room, yep. which is really critical. So I have an aunt who's had several TIAs recently, and she figured this out because, you know, she had she didn't want to go in an ambulance. Had her friend take it one time. You know, you wait. Now she knows. You call 911, you get right in there, and all the, the time is so critical. Yeah. And I was thinking, too, one of our um, talks we did when you gave out the files of life. Those are great to have, great to have right there on your refrigerator if you have them. Um, again, because it will list, you know, your primary, they'll be able to see, okay, you normally go into the Faulkner, or, you know, it's, again, it's, so much going on. You're scared, you're nervous, your family members, your friends are scared and nervous. It's to have something that you can just grab with the bulk of all of your medical information right there is life saving. And the uh, also the are you okay? If any of you are using that or if you live alone, you really should be on the Are You Okay? Uh, the are, are You Okay program with um, uh, the uh, Sheriff's Office. Yeah, are some of you on that? Actually, there were only two or three people at the talk we did yeah. that were on it, but it's a free service, and you register. You can't, you can't hear. Oh, more. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, the sheriff's office has a, a program, Are You Okay? And you register for it. It's free. Um, and they will call you at a fixed time every, every morning. So if you don't answer, then you know they have a backup number you would give for them to call or whatever. But that way, especially if you live alone, it's it's really important to have that um, contact. And even if you have some question, like you said, if you're questioning about how you're feeling yourself or whatever, you can talk to them. But they will call you to make sure that you're okay. So um, I have information on that. If a few people need that, and I, I left some flyers here, but I can bring them in. I can, you know, make sure they're here. Do it. It's free. It's a great service. It's a great program. It really is. Again, a lot of services that I just don't think we utilize enough because we need to get the awareness out of what's out there that we can use. It's services that are available to us. Any other questions or comments? No? I'll, I'll make one more comment. Sure. The, the two TIAs, and you just said they were coming in for different reasons. Sure. Uh, we did try them. I didn't think it was going to be that important, but I knew it was, a, it was important. The other thing happened the second time, and um, I 
must have had a clock in the kitchen that had numbers on it. And they were missing on the left-hand side. But numbers. Oh. That's, all, that's all I can tell you. So oh. it's, it could be the ha face. I wasn't sure. thinking about this or anything. I just, no. things that are missing. I think that, that somewhat common in the sense that um, I had gotten a call from a friend before he was, oh, <coughs> they, had, they were, they were uh, on vacation and they stopped at a rest place and the wife went in to go to the restroom. But she came back and said, all I see is men, the men's room. It's because the WO, she oh, could yeah. no longer see that. So, so my friend had the presence of mind to immediately call 911 and she had had a stroke. Wow. So you, you can't, you can't think, oh, I'm just stupid, I'm not looking. Mm -hmm. That's right. not, you can't discount well, that. I did have an incident um, maybe four years ago where um, I called my doctor's office and that turned out to be quite a mistake because the person in the doctor's office uh, was concerned about my symptoms but said she would make an appointment for me at the clinic that was in the group practice. And so I drove from Walpole to um, Smithfield, Rhode Island to a doctor in the practice that happened to be open on the weekend. And he took a quick look at me and put me in the ambulance to go to um, the hospital in Providence, which is now Lifespan. And um, when I got there, this terrible accident had happened on I-95 where it was something like 16 Polish people had been wiped out. They were traveling in a vehicle with no seat belts and they'd been ejected onto the highway and they had all come in to the emergency room there and got priority over me. So uh, <laughs> even with the best intentions and being brought by an ambulance, you can sometimes end up in a ridiculous situation where you don't really get attention until 12 hours later. So <laughs> you can never be quite sure what's going to happen, but uh, if you follow the j basic principle of call the ambulance first rather than call the doctor's office, get referred to another doctor, um, and eventually wind up in the hospital and then find the hospital can't handle you, you're in a real mess. Oh, sure, sure, absolutely. Mm. And thank goodness you were all right driving from Walpole down to Rhode Island, you sure. know, goodness, sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> thank goodness, thank okay, goodness. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. Again, there's lots of information over on the table. My card's over there, too. If you think of any questions or, you know, concerns, resources, anything, just always feel free to reach out.